Hi there, thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to do an analysis and valuation of the Coca-Cola company, ticker symbol KO. You probably know this company, and you've probably drank at least one product of theirs. I know I have many times over the course of my life. So without further ado, let's go. Now, Coke is everywhere. Not just the actual cola product, but Coke-owned products. They have brands such as Schweppes, Sprite, Fanta, Smart Water, Dasani, Topo Chico, Minute Maid, Fairlife Milk, Fuse Tea, Powerade. It's a lot of products. They have a lot of different offerings for a lot of different segments. It's not just the cola, which is this very sweet sugary drink, but also now they have even vegan or non-lactose milk. They sell juices, they sell health shots. They now are diversifying into some products that contain alcohol as well. And they are everywhere. They have over 2.2 billion servings a day, over 30 million customer retail outlets, over 200 bottling partners, over 950 production facilities. They're a massive company. And that would be something important to note. And they also are doing pretty cool things here. They're basically making a lot of their products premium or premium versions of their products. They're making wellness products as well, which they can also sell a little more expensively. They are trying to make sustainable packaging a thing. And basically just trying to make every single product a little more profitable, essentially. And it really does seem like it's paying off, you know? It seems like their revenue grows by a very large amount over the course of the years. And this is true. They have awesome revenue growth. It's especially interesting and important for a company of this size to be able to grow this quickly. It's very impressive, as a matter of fact. Free cash flow has also grown a ton, and I love to see that, frankly, and I love that they're mentioning free cash flow, because that's a number I always focus on. And they're everywhere. They're across the whole world, and that's going to be very important for Coca-Cola as well. And you can see here they talk about their total addressable market, which is also expected to grow essentially as the world population grows, as they create more products that they can market to different segments of the world population. So you see here, for example, that their sparkling soft drinks all of a sudden are growing a little less, but their emerging beverages, which include ready alcohol ready to drink beverages, and their energy beverages, and their hot beverages are going to start growing a lot more. So yes, the world is becoming more health conscious, maybe a little less uh, keen to have those sugary drinks, but they have other products in the pipeline that are going to make part of that revenue mix. So that's very important to note, right? And they are trying to also drive their margins. They're trying to make their margins a little more comfortable, which is great when you're a company this big. It's a little difficult to be lean. You have to basically optimize everything. You have to be very good at both a large and a small level at optimizing those margins. It's cool that they want to do this on top of growing revenue so much. So it's great to see this overall focus. They also have great free cash flow, it seems, but there is free cash flow taking a hit in this upcoming year, at least according to them. Now, they're targeting, I think this is the percentage of net income that they say they're targeting, but I don't actually know. And the thing is, here at least in the, invers in the investor presentation, this looks a little arbitrary because it won't tell us roughly at what percentage it will be. So while it's telling us that there's going to be headwinds that may lower free cash flow for 2023, it's not really giving us a number or a percentage of net income that it's going to be. So what gives? I think this is something that I take away from the presentation because you're telling us something, but you're not giving us a forecast. You're not telling us by how much it's going to affect the overall free cash flow mix. But it's something that we can sort of watch out for, right? You can maybe, if you're projecting free cash flow, subtract $700 million from it, right? Maybe from this these estimated uh, payments that Coca-Cola will have to make that they're telling you about. And they also have revenue from all over the world, right? This is their revenue mix from in 2022 and 2021. And, you know, it's pretty diversified. Most of it is still in North America. But here, let's make it even more interesting. Here is the revenue mix, essentially. And you can see it's all around the world, mostly North America, but also their bottling investments. They have 
different bottling companies that they invest in, actually. They're a partner in the operations of those bottling companies. And you can also see here in the mix of operating income, it's actually very different. For example, you can see that Latin America, over 50% of the revenue turns to operating income, which is a very different story with North America, for example. Coca-Cola is a lot more profitable in certain regions than in others. Asia Pacific and Latin America, for example, as opposed to their global ventures or to Europe, Middle East and Africa and North America. So that's very interesting. But they are profitable in every single one of their geographies, essentially, which is great to see. And it's great to see that they have significant diversification within geographies. This means that they're shielded. You know, if one country goes in a recession, if one region goes in a recession, they're still going to sell to other regions. And that's great to see. Now, looking at their income statement, they've also have some stellar revenue growth. They have had some basically growth in their operating income as well. And in their net income, sort of. And this is great to see. This is fantastic to see. Even though stuff like their advertising expenses or selling general administrative expenses have been growing, they haven't been growing as much as the revenue, which is great to see. All in all, the balance sheet looks good. I don't see anything here that really causes me to say this is a red flag. They do have also a lot of debt at the end of the day. In long-term debt, they do have 36 billion US dollars as opposed to 43 billion that they make in revenue. But obviously, that's not all going to be available to pay off the debt. It would be more like this number, this 9 billion, 9.5 billion. So they do have a good amount of debt. But you'll see that it is at a really low interest rate on average. Now, that interest rate is higher now than it was before, from 1.7% to 2.3%. Well, as a percentage difference, that's pretty high. But in an absolute number, 2.3% in terms of your debt interest rate is really, really low. And they're probably interested in keeping some of this debt at that low interest rate because if their investments are going to grow way quicker than that, then there's no reason to really pay off the debt early. And a lot of lenders also, I think, see Coca-Cola as a reliable company that is very likely to pay back their debts and thus would offer them lower interest rates to begin with. So the debt situation is something we are taking a look at. It is important. But the thing is, Coca-Cola is a company that you would expect to have a good chunk of debt. And that's sort of okay. You do want to see lowering overall net debt. But at the same time, at such a low interest rate, yeah, if their investments with this debt can pay off more than the interest rate of the debt, which I think is very likely, the lower the interest rate is, as in this case, then it doesn't really matter. Now, I'm also going to calculate free cash flow in order to do a valuation of this stock. And it's actually really easy because essentially I grab a percentage. What percentage of revenue gets turned to free cash flow over the long term? The average is 23.57%. Funnily enough, free cash flow usually ends up being equivalent to net income. And the net income of Coca Cola also has ended up being 23 or 23.5% of the revenue. So it's a fun number because you don't have to do a lot of guesswork around it. You just have to sort of roll with it. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just say 23%. I'm going to round out a little bit of revenue is going to be turned to free cash flow. And that's what I'm going to roll with for the future for my valuation. And with that, I can do a discounted cash flow model. What am I doing here? I'm basically grabbing the free cash flow in 2022. And I'm growing it by 5% from 2023 to 2026. And then I give it a perpetual growth rate of 3%. It's going to grow by 3% in perpetuity, right? And I'm going to have a required rate of return of 11%. That's 1% more per year than the market average, which would be 10% at least, for example's sake. And with that, divided by the total amount of shares out, I get a fair value of $31.56. However, we have to adjust for net debt, which is the total debt minus the total amount of cash, which is about... $29.5 billion. And adjusting with that, the fair value I get post debt is of $24.72 with an 11% required rate of return and a 3% perpetual growth rate. Now, where's Coca Cola stock right now? 
huh? I know it's very interesting to see this contrast between 24.72 US dollars and 60.37 US dollars. And if you see in the last five years, Coca-Cola has not traded anywhere near any of these two numbers, even if we discount the debt, which as I said, their debt situation is pretty healthy all in all, frankly. So even looking at this number, they haven't traded even close to that. And we're going to have to analyze this. We're going to have to see. But yeah, I mean, Coca-Cola has done good in the last five years. Not stellar, not great. It hasn't doubled, for example, but it's done good. It is trading a pretty high P ratio of 26.5. And it does have a nice dividend yield of 3, although it's been 3% for the last at least 4 years. So, you know, it's important to note that Coca-Cola seems like a good company, but there's something there going on. And I'm going to use another metric, which is EV to EBITDA, enterprise value to EBITDA. And usually there's just a quick and dirty ratio with which you can see the relative value of something, either relative to other companies, to its peers, or to itself throughout its history. And Coca-Cola seems to be very expensive. It's way larger than any of its peers, of course. PepsiCo is the only one that compares, but PepsiCo also sells food, not just beverages. So it's a little bit different of a company. But yeah, it seems to be trading at a much higher EV to EBITDA, both trailing and forward, than most of its peers, and it's also a lot bigger. So it clearly is trading at a premium valuation. Even based on its own history, this is a chart of their EV to EBITDA over the years, at the end of every fiscal year. And would you look at that? It went from a roughly 15 to now in the 2220 range. So even relative to its own history, it is trading at a premium. So once again, I ask, huh? Well, this discrepancy may seem shocking, but it is a byproduct of Coca-Cola trading at a constant premium. A company that is recognized as one of the largest constantly, including the passive income funds, ETFs, retirement accounts, etc., is less likely to trade at a significant discount. Every time a fund wants to be created or wants to add more of in, in volume, then they're probably going to include Coca-Cola without even thinking of the valuation, you know? So Coca-Cola is going to be a stock that investors will go to all the time and it's recognized as such and it's seen as a defensive stock because everyone drinks a coca-cola product you know they're not that affected by global recessions especially with such a white moat which they do have which such a diversified base of products and of customers which they do have so the thing is this premium is recognized and people are constantly buying coca-cola stock funds are buying coca-cola stock and this makes they're the likelihood of them trading at a discount much, much lower to begin with. Let's talk about dividends. Dividends are nice, but it's a very slow grower of dividends. And to the extent that their dividend payout ratio is actually pretty high, it is between 60 and 70% sometimes. And their dividend growth rate over the last five years has been a little bit over 5%, maybe in that 5 to 6% range. And that's a problem because sometimes a lot of peers are growing at double digits, their dividends, that is. So the absolute rate of dividends may not look bad, but the growth rate is just not there. And with such a high payout ratio, well, yeah, they can't afford to grow dividends that much. Their shares are also diluted rather than repurchased. If you look at the long term, Coca-Cola doesn't really buy back that many shares. They always do buy back a little bit, but they seem to issue more every time. So the growth is great, but it is simply not enough to compensate for the premium price that is being asked of Coca-Cola. And this is very important to note. It's trading at a premium price for a reason, and it does have a very good balance sheet. It does have a very wide moat, and you can't just take Coca-Cola out of the market. There's no competitor that's going to take every Coca-Cola product out of the market from today to tomorrow. But because of the nature of it, because it's such a large recognizable company that is constantly being bought, it's also less likely for it to trade at a discount. And that is what I'm looking for personally, is a discount. It is what I'm doing with this discounted cash flow valuation by looking at EV to EBITDA, both relative to itself, relative to its peers. So for me personally, Coca-Cola is something that even though I recognize as a great company, is probably something I'm not that interested in. And that's because valuation matters. Coca-Cola is a great company, but at the right price. And I don't think at this moment, it has the right price. Maybe one day it will. 
I know in Warren Buffett bought Coca-Cola. He bought at the right price. And that's why he's seen exponential gains from it. But he hasn't really bought that much Coca-Cola besides what he gets from dividends compared to the other things he's been buying, compared to how he's bought Apple, how he's bought Oxy, etc. So we just have to wait. And maybe one day Coca-Cola will be at a good price. Maybe it won't. And then we'll just find other opportunities. But valuation matters a lot because that is our total return at the end of the day. Now, with that said, I hope you found this analysis useful. And if you have any questions about this analysis, comment down below. I read all the comments and I'll be happy to reply. So if you want to see more like this, make sure to subscribe. Make sure to request any stocks you want me to analyze. I'll look at them. If they're interesting, I'll make a video on them. And with that said, I won't take up any more of your day. So have a great rest of your day.